Opportunity Lives Editor-in-Chief John Hart is here today to dispel some Trump myths with us. Hey, John, good to see you. Good to see you. Great to be on. So Donald Trump, he is up by double, double, <laughs> double digits compared to right. his <clears throat> rivals. And at the same time, you've got two-thirds of Americans say that they're actually fearful of uh -huh. a Donald Trump presidency. Right. So you've got some myths here sure. that you want to dispel. And the first one is that voters actually care. Yes. They well, well, they don't yet. They do to some degree. And even if voters care more than they have in previous cycles at this point, the race at this stage is unformed. So if you look at the Republican primary races in 2012, 2008, go to realclearpolitics.com, you can see major fluctuations in the window in the six weeks before the Iowa caucuses. So we're coming up on that, on that period. 80% of the fluctuations happen after that stage. So I would argue that the race as we have been talking about it for months is a little bit like retailers bringing out the Christmas displays, not just after Halloween, but, it, but in July. So our analysis is entirely premature across the board. And our themes and our, our narratives don't reflect, I think, where the electorate is and where it's going to be at this point. But we've, we've got a short holiday period now in True. December, and then it's just January before You're right. <clears throat> we've got the Iowa caucuses, February right. 1st. I mean, it's time to tune no, in. No, it is. It is. It? Yeah, it is. I think, I think people, and this is the time when people really start to tune in historically, and this has been studied extensively. So the last two presidential cycles, 40% of voters didn't make up their mind until six weeks before, and that was when the choice was binary between two people rather than a large field like eight or ten we have in the Republican field. So I think we're going to see big, again, big fluctuations, and that's the pattern that we've seen in the last two Republican primary cycles. And so, so, so I would challenge so the word dominating. I don't see Trump really dominating at all. I think he has consistently been opposed by a supermajority of Republican voters, and that's been true for months. So, so Trump, all of what Trump, we've heard so far is just background noise it is I think it's well not 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 totally but I think to a large extent we you know what we have is we have an a-list celebrity someone who is incredibly entertaining and funded here we are talking about Trump because he's an interest he's a great story so it's a self-reinforcing discussion that's been happening and uh, again I think I think once people really focus in on the race we're gonna see big big changes coming well we've been talking about the next election since what the midterms I know. It feels Maybe like before it, yeah. that yeah. I don't know well, it's a sort of a perpetual discussion yeah. Yeah. Well, myth number two here is that this is the year of the outsider versus the insider. Yes. Tell us about yes. that. Yes. Well, let me give you a little quick history. I worked for a senator named Tom Coburn for about 10 years, starting in the late 90s. He was one of the most effective, quote, anti-establishment outsiders who served in Congress in the past 20 years. We got rid of earmarks. We, we, he led fights against leadership. So I've lived this anti-establishment fight. And so the dynamic that we see in Congress today and on the, in the Republican side is the rise of the Tea Party, and the truth is the Tea Party has essentially taken over the GOP already. So conservatives, to a large extent, are the establishment. Uh, back, back in the 90s, there were 30 members of a group called the Republican Study Committee. Today, there are about 180. So you have conservatives who have, who have really moved the party, I think, in a much better direction towards the area of reform, propositional conservatism, and Paul Ryan embodies that shift. So, so this outsider versus insider thing is a bit of a farce because the outsiders have already won. Mm. <laughs> that shift has already happened. Mm -hmm. and so, but Trump uses that argument to elevate himself. Uh, Ted Cruz does that as well. But the, the real divide is between what I call the, the novelty and non-novelty candidates. In other words, the people who are serious and those who aren't. So I would define a novelty candidate. Somebody who gets in the race, like Ben Carson or Donald Trump, and they just kind of make it up as they go along. There's a sense that they don't really have the policy depth that Marco Rubio has, Jeb Bush has, Ted Cruz has, uh, and Kasich and others. So uh, that's, that's where I think we are right now. That's the real divide. Have we seen these uh, types of novelty candidates, as you call them, emerge sure. in past elections? Absolutely, yeah. Herman Cain was a novelty candidate. He came out of nowhere. He had a big surge and then a big fall. <clears throat> uh, I think Michelle Bachman was one. I think even... And we've had dark horses, who I, would, I wouldn't call Rick Santorum a novelty candidate, but he came out of nowhere and won the Iowa caucuses. Uh, so we've absolutely have had, Ross Perot, to some degree, was that kind of a candidate. Mm -hmm. um, so he had a shtick. When, when might we see uh, sort of uh, the tide turn to um, more credible candidates that mm -hmm. would emerge now? Well, I think, you know, Donald Trump, the two things that he cannot withstand, he cannot withstand not being the center of attention 
and not being the leader. So, for example, in Iowa, Ted Cruz, according to some polls, has already overtaken Trump. So part of the reason Ted Cruz came out, or, or rather Trump came out with this call to ban all Muslims was to take attention away from the fact that he was losing, that he's about to lose his lead in Iowa. So I would predict that either it's going to be Cruz or Rubio or someone else will have a surge, and that will be just completely unacceptable to Trump. Trump supporters don't care what he says, but they will care if he's perceived as a winner or not. And, and Ted uh, Cruz has said uh, uh, there would be a place for Donald Trump in my administration. <laughs> right, so uh, he wants to get all the Trump supporters. How would he feel being, you know, yeah. in somebody else's administration sure. and, and not uh, the big cheese? So I yeah. don't know. This kind of goes with what you're saying. Myth number three here: Donald Trump's surprising strength. Yeah. What's the reality here? Yeah. Well, again, the reality is he he's he's backed by about 30 percent of voters. And there was a great story in today's Washington Post, actually, about a Frank Luntz focus group. And bo the bottom line of that study was uh, it doesn't matter what Donald Trump says. His supporters are going to stay with him no matter what. But here's the flip side of that, is that his unfavorable numbers are extremely high. So the people, the supermajority of Republicans who don't want Trump are very unlikely to move towards him. So th the real dynamic in the race is you have, you have support that's dispersed among a number of serious, credible candidates. So the Republican field this time is very strong, very deep. You have Marco Rubio, you've got Cruz, you've got Bush, you've got Kasich, Christie, and others who are all very credible presidential caliber candidates. Well, you have this <clears throat> wide field of some strength, as you, as you mentioned, right. <clears throat> but at the same time, you can't dispute that Trump has staying power. Right, he has, and, sure. And, you know, people have never thought that this would right. continue well into this late in the fall and that his numbers would keep going up the way they have, now double digits ahead of his uh, nearest right. rivals, after his most outlandish statement. Sure, sure, but, but the lead in the overall uh, poll right now doesn't mean much. The only polls that matter is really what happens in the Iowa and New Hampshire caucuses, and that has a big effect mm -hmm. on the rest of the Super Tuesday primaries that happen just a few weeks later. Uh, well, but no, again, you've Trump got you've got 70 percent. You got 70 percent of Republicans who don't want him and are not likely to go towards him. So, it would be historically unprecedented to have someone with that low of support, 30 percent, become the Republican nominee, and with who has unfavorable numbers as high as he does. That's well, he, never happened before. His campaign mm. uh, effort is very. Uh, uh, savvy, I think. Yeah. What could some of the other candidates maybe learn from what Donald Trump is doing? Well, I'm not sure they want to learn <laughs> from what Donald Trump is doing, to be honest with you. Because I think what Trump is doing is running as a celebrity candidate in a celebrity culture. So there's been a lot of great critiques written about Donald Trump's plans, but my view of him is he is not really someone to be taken seriously. I think he's, again, a novelty candidate, kind of like funnel cakes or cotton candy at the fair. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, it feels good. feels good going down, but it doesn't always stay down. Great analogy long. there. All right, let's get to your last myth, and that yeah. is that Ted Cruz is an outsider like Trump. Yeah. Ted Cruz is, is a brilliantly gifted, fantastically talented Washington politician. <clears throat> so Cruz has done a masterful job of presenting himself as a fighter against the establishment. <clears throat> but the way he has fought has been more about elevating his brand and his name rather than the cause. So, for example, his stand against Obamacare was not about advancing a reform alternative to Obamacare. It was about positioning himself as the lone conservative fighter in the race. And it's just not, it's just not credible. Other than Ted Cruz, um, with so much turmoil in the Republican field, uh, will attention maybe turn to a strong third uh, place candidate right now, maybe a Marco Rubio. Is he the one that could perhaps be. the Democrats might fear the most? I think he probably is the one Democrats fear the most. And if you look at the race and you, and you watch the debates, I think the debates really do matter because people get a sense of who is truly talented. So our two franchise players on, on the right are Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz. They're both extremely talented uh, people, and I think Rubio could break through, but you still could have the others break out as well, whether it's Bush or Kasich or Christie. We'll be watching. Check out John Hart's new piece. It's titled Trump's Strengths and the Big Myths of 2016 in Opportunity Lives, the website. Thanks so much for coming in today. Very interesting discussion. And we'll be right back after this.